This is the time of the great turning. This is the time for which we were born. I get my comfort from the fact that there are millions and millions of people waking up to these realities and making really courageous changes in their own lives. The sooner you start living as though you lived in a post-oil world, then the gentler that transition is going to be. We are seeing that the healthiest, sanest response, and indeed, that which we yearn for is to rediscover our mutual belonging, our community. So the Finthorn Community Eco Village is on the Murray Firth in the north of Scotland. The community is almost 50 years old. Right from the beginning, Co-creation with nature was one of the core pillars of the community and over the last 15 to 20 years the development of an eco-village of a sustainable community has become a more conscious part of the energy of the community. In 2006 we commissioned a study into our ecological footprint, that's a measure of resource use within the community, and this study found that our use of resources is about half the national average. This is the lowest footprint as far as we know ever recorded in the industrialised world. The principal factors behind this historically low ecological footprint are renewable energy generation, very energy efficient housing, the fact that we eat a lot of locally produced organic vegetables and a transport related footprint that is much lower than the national average both because most people are able to get to work on foot or by bicycle and because we have carpools. We decided to host a conference that would explore how we could maintain if not enhance quality of life while dramatically reducing our resource use and our dependence on fossil fuels. We invited to the conference a number of presenters, each of whom are internationally recognised experts in their fields. Joanna Macy, scholar of Buddhism, deep ecologist, eco-philosopher. Richard Heinberg, widely recognised as the leading writer and commentator on peak oil internationally. Rob Hopkins, founder of the Transition Town Movement and the originator of Energy Descent Planning. Dorothy McLean, co-founder of the Fintorn Foundation Community, whose impulse was co-creation with nature. Megan Quinn from the Community Solution in the United States and co-producer of the film Power of Community, How Cuba Survived Peak Oil. And Leslie Quildy is a professional clown who's resident in the community and she helps us explore difficult issues through the medium of play and laughter. I'm not going to ask you how you travelled here. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Even a total fool would not into that <laughs> Well, obviously, we have taken from the planet without giving anything back. If we thought we've had any sense of our of the planetary wholeness, we would have, would have done it differently, but we didn't. We were just greedy. Over the past couple of hundred years, economic growth has been achieved by dramatically increasing the rate at which we consume both renewable and non-renewable natural resources. Uh, the natural rhythm of nature, of ecosystems, is growth and contraction. There's nothing in nature that continually grows because there's not infinite space within nature. We live on a finite planet. 
I call it the Industrial Growth Society, which treats the earth as a source of commodities, a storehouse from which we can extract resources and uh, turn them into goods, weapons, waste, as fast as possible in order to maximize one thing, corporate profits. We're completely hooked in oil. In almost every area of modern life that you can think of, the military, industrial, agriculture, construction, transport, whatever, these are almost entirely dependent on the availability of abundant sources of cheap fossil fuels. What peak oil means is that the easy to find, easy to develop, cheap and very high quality oil reserves have already been depleted. And now we're talking about going from oil and gas back to lower quality hydrocarbons like coal and even worse ones like tar sands and, and oil shale. The results are going to be, of course, environmentally ruinous and we're not going to be able to operate modern industrial economies on these low-grade fossil fuels. When Cuba lost half their oil overnight, literally when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, it was a tremendous time of crisis in the country. The average Cuban lost 30 pounds. There was cases of malnutrition. Uh, people couldn't get to work. There was just no oil available for transportation. Um, the agricultural system collapsed. Um, it was a tremendous period of darkness. The point at which half the world's oil supply has been used up is upon us now. The peak of global oil production is predicted to occur around 2010, or it may have peaked already. We will only know the exact date with hindsight. Beyond the peak, oil shortages are likely to be the norm, and the price of oil will soar as demand for oil increases along with world population. Why I feel that the Cubans were able to come through it with such innovation and ingenuity and strength and courage was because they had very strong neighborhoods and communities that supported each other. Also, they really just came together and realized that their government wasn't going to save them, that they had to create the solutions themselves. And that was the only way that they would survive. We have to look at peak oil and climate change as being two parts of the same issue. And the idea that we can sustain a globalised consumer society on something other than oil is just a nonsense, because there isn't anything. have this huge investment uh, that we've built 750 million cars in the world that aren't going away. So instead of scrapping all of them, we can use that resource as much as possible. Um, and with only about one and a half people driving in a car in the U.S., if we can increase that to four or five people, then we'll be getting cars that will get virtually 125 people miles per gallon. The car club here at Findhorn started two years ago when a group of us got together and used a model that had been used in another community for about 16 years, tried and tested model. And we now have grown to, we've got four cars going on to five and 20 members. So when a new member joins the car club, they get a key for a locked cupboard where the keys for the cars are kept. And beside that there's a bookie sheet where you can book the cars in advance. Inside the cars, there's also another set of sheets where when you finish your journey, you just write in how many miles you've gone and how many hours you've used it for. And you then get a bill at the end of the month that will be based on the amount of usage you've had of the car in that month. 
So one of the main advantages is simply economic. Each member pays like a quarter of what it would cost to have their own car. And then they're just paying their, their petrol costs on top of that. So in terms of the overall transport picture, I see the car club as fitting in with other things, especially public transport. That's obviously the, the most environmentally friendly way of doing things. But when people really have a need for more flexibility, going a trip somewhere, a group of people going together, the car club's a solution that really uses much less resources. Small and local communities, I think, are going to be the places that we need to return to. Because we're going to have less energy, we won't be able to live on such a large scale. I think people are going to have to create community where they are. Many people won't be able to relocate. And so I think suburban areas, I think urban areas, rural areas are going to become their own self-sufficient communities. We'll also see a lot more urban agriculture. The idea that food production is something that happens in the countryside and we live in the cities is, is going to be nonsense. And in a sense, having urban landscapes which are lawn, and pointless shrubs is a very odd kind of a, a luxury of, a, of an age with more oil than sense, really. Nobody ever could do that before. There's been estimates that all the lawns in the United States, if it was all converted to agriculture, then we could feed 40 million people. With a couple acre lots filled with lawns, if those can be turned into gardens, they could be actually quite productive areas. Transition Town Forest started about a year ago when a couple of people came together to discuss climate change and the environmental impact that's going on around us. And after we had met for a couple of months, we thought that a practical project would be something very useful and we focused on getting allotments. And it took us almost a year until we're standing here today. And we've been in this place for about a month now and to see the transformation from an idle field into the cultivated spaces where people are working, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And to see the spread of ages from very young to quite old people. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Copy me. That's it, you copy me. You dig it in and you pick it up and you turn it over. Yeah, you manage? That's a good boy. We're working very much on using permaculture principles, so we're working with nature. We have created something we call pods. We have approximately six people to each pod. And by having upwards to 12 pods, we're hoping to satisfy a demand for somewhere around 70 or 80 people. Digging away and planting away at a tremendous speed. It's a joy to behold. Here. I've done a lot of things, been motivated by a lot of impulses. <laughs> you know, I've, I've gone so far as to wear clothing completely knit from recycled rabbit hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and, and I live on a tiny farm where I give birth to those rabbits myself. <laughs> Well, resilience is a concept that comes from ecology and it's the observation that when ecosystems encounter shock from outside, some of them just fall to bits and some of them are able to readapt, uh, you know, shift, change, but keep their basic functioning together and then evolve through that. We've created a society that is far less resilient than it was even 50 years ago. So if, for example, you look at food production, we are increasingly dependent on imports, not only for lux luxuries, but even for basic items. So if there were, for example, an interruption in the oil supply, how would we feed ourselves?
We're going to have to be producing food more locally. There's a great movement towards local food production. Community-supported agricultural schemes are developing, which are an important way for communities to support new farmers and to make sure that they can continue farming. She has the oldest CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Scheme in Scotland. That's where our, our subscribers actually help us to grow the food, mainly weeding and harvesting. This box scheme grows its own produce. That means seasonal. Uh, it's local, it's grown only four miles away, and then right here, couldn't get much more local than that, so very low food miles. We grow 55 types of vegetable through the year, and five types of fruit. When you decide to subscribe, you can make the choice either to um, help out a few times over the year or not, and it's cheaper if you do Family subscribers are invited to uh, contribute three half days a year and the single shareholders two. And this doesn't sound like a huge amount but it makes a big difference to Earthshare because we can call on large groups of people at those times of the year, particularly weeding in the late spring, early summer, when uh, we would have a, a really tough time spending day after day after day weeding a carrot field but 30 people can do that work in a morning and have a good time doing it. The pigs are helping us do a job which saves a lot of, lot of tractor hours. Also they put good manure down for us. They're going to break up the ground and ready for us to plough and turn over and do our cultivations through the winter. It's actually about relationship, building relationship between the people who are growing the food on the land and the land itself and the, and the subscribers. We had the Steiner school children aged between 9 and 10. Stop! We're going to run into you! Just try it. Okay! Two, three! The children were using a donkey plough. They've come and they're going to sow some oats today and they'll see that process go through, maybe make a meal out of the oats when it's ready to harvest. So growing like this organically and for local use has always inspired me most of all for the benefits for the earth and for the planet because we're not having to transport food around and saving a lot of uh, oil and energy in that way. We're also not putting any pesticides on the land so we're keeping it uh, pristine in, in, in that respect and we're also connecting people to the land so that's the, the three big benefits to me from working in this way. Harvest day at Cologne Garden. We are harvesting for the Earthshare subscribers. It's very important for the people as well as for us to connect with the earth, to reconnect with the miracle of growing your own food, your own vegetables, that you can grow together with friends and neighbors and that you can create something together which really sustains you. And the sustaining is on a much larger level than just on the physical. It's really, it's relearning skills of harvesting, of sowing and, and reconnecting with the miracle of that. Eco-villages and the transition movement are very much about a relocalization of the economy, about giving people back the skills they need to be able to provide for more of their own needs. Any solution to this crisis, whether it's national government level, local government level, education, medicine, whatever, has to take those two things, cutting carbon, building resilience. Mm -hmm. Then you're asking the right questions that you can then build on. 
Currently, the project is the largest community-owned renewable energy generation project in Scotland. We always had plans to expand the wind park here and now we've got four windmills that have a total output of about 750 kilowatts uh, when the wind is blowing at its maximum. The park grid serves uh, between 150 and 200 residents, the Holiday Caravan Park and a variety of organisations and businesses and the windmills generate the electricity that they use. Now, when the wind is blowing and we're not using a lot of electricity, we export to the national grid and then we import when the wind isn't blowing. Uh, so the grid gets used as a kind of battery. But overall, we're net exporters and are producing between 30 and 40 percent more than we're actually using on site. And there's plenty of extra capacity then also for future expansion. A life-sustaining society is one that delivers to future generations a living ecosystem that can provide as much abundance for those who come after us as for us, that we do not deplete and we do not contaminate the living body of Earth for those who come after us. The earth itself can teach us how to do this. And we're learning it in all fields like biomimicry and permaculture. We're learning from natural systems how to live within the limits of earth. So this is the living machine, the ecological sewage treatment plant for the Fintorn Foundation. Here we're treating sewage and wastewater of about 300 residents. The living machine uses natural processes inspired by nature to clean the water. We have nine tanks here and there are four different parts to the system. We use a range of plants and air and microorganisms which each contribute to breaking down the water and cleansing it. I can just show you here a small sample of the water fleas that are living in the clarifier. They're eating the dead bacteria. So at the end of the system we have a small pond with a toad, a frog and four fish which shows us that the water is really healthy. Permaculture is a design science, is a design approach for the creation of sustainable human settlements. So when you're looking at what would the, a post-peak world look like, what are the elements of a post-peak settlement? You've got economic elements, you've got uh, buildings, agriculture, food production, uh, energy, all these different things. Permaculture is the, is the design glue that we use to stick them all together, assemble them in the most efficient way possible. And a lot of the time it's based on what is really applied common sense, which cheap oil has allowed us to forget common sense. Who needs common sense? As we walk into the garden, you'll see the garden becomes far more dense and there's, most of this is wild. It's an edible landscape. It's wild and productive. And then I don't have to do the gardening. The garden starts to garden itself. The key major point with any type of eco-village, whether it's a permaculture one, is to observe the landscape, observe the climate, the rain, the sun, the wind, how it's affecting that. Placing your house in that, in the right place, instead of where the best soils are. We have a wonderful microclimate down in here, and it's moist. There's a pond, of course. The pond is multifunctional. The chickens are multifunctional. It's a really big thing in permaculture. How many tasks? That's just not a nice, pretty pond. That's got frogs in it, hoverflies. They're helping to control the insect population of the garden. The key part of the whole process is mimic nature wherever possible. How does nature build soil? The leaves fall and it keeps building over years. The chickens are my tractor. If I can allow the chickens to help to get in and dig and manure the soil, then half the work is done. 
We're certainly going to have to develop more um, innovative ways to grow food using less fossil fuel through organic and permaculture methods. And we're also going to have to change our diet um, to eat more local food, more seasonally. We're going to have to start switching to many more fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains and nuts. Ironically, the things that are most healthy for us. Most of the things that I've planted throughout the garden have some edible function. And so I've got plums and pears and apples and cherries and hazelnuts and lots of other sort of wild things appearing naturally. And they're throughout the garden. Instead of putting them in monocultures and keeping them separate, you can actually walk through your whole landscape and you become like a hunter-gatherer. You've organized the landscape to be productive and then you work from that perspective. Go for a walk in the garden and harvest what you find as you go along. Permaculture is all about placing yourself and your houses and everything in the landscape, from the windmills to the living machine. So in some ways, this is a little tiny permaculture patch. But if I look at this Findhorn Foundation experiment here, there are so many key features that would be seen as an overall perfect permaculture patterning. Between four and six hundred hens different times. We keep them in small groups of about hundred. They're a free range of course, organic. And we keep them for two or three years, which is considerably longer than most commercial hens are kept. And we sell all the eggs locally, mostly through the Phoenix at Findhorn. We also supply the monks at Pluskillen Abbey. And sort them into extra large, large, medium and small. They have weights on here, so they, they, the heaviest ones come off first. Using small groups of about a hundred hens is, is you get get better welfare than some of the big commercial um, free range units have up to six thousand birds in one house and they don't really free range as much. So I reckon in the summer our hens get twenty five percent of the diet from the grass and the insects that they eat outside. It's a better system, but it is very labour intensive. <laughs> <laughs> means going around all the houses twice a day collecting eggs and then the, the packing which happens in here. And uh, it's a lot easier to feed 6,000 birds in one place than if they're scattered around the farm in lots of little houses. But that's the system that we, we prefer. We've created these institutions that require growth, uh, but that's not how economies have to work. I mean, think of you know, think of, of small-scale businesses, you know, the local baker. Does the local baker have to open a chain and start other bakeries in other towns just in order to get by? What's wrong with just keeping the bakery going? And uh, maybe one of the children of, of the baker's family decides to, you know, go into the business, and it can go on for generations like that. That's the way life used to work. And that's, that's, that's the way we, we need to start thinking again. Thinking not, not of um, endless profit, but of sufficiency. So at a time when tens of thousands of small bakeries have closed over the last couple of decades, we're really proud to be re-establishing good craft bakery bread back into the local area. We make about 100,000 loaves a year. Every product is handmade. We use no flour improvers, no preservatives, no additives. Sugar is used absolutely sparingly. And we now have a wide range of breads made from flour, which is allergy and gluten free. We do a daily run on the Fintorn Peninsula. Our first stop is always the Phoenix, which carries the full range of our products seven days a week. All the uh, ingredients that we use are either local, organic or fairly traded, ideally all three in one go. The 
reason for choosing Ayrshire cows is that they're cows that are well suited to our Scottish climate because they're a native breed. She has a good long life because she's not producing a lot of milk like an industrially bred cow, she will last longer, she has good feet that cope with the wet in Scottish climate and she has a good neat udder that tucks in underneath her legs and is less prone to disease. If we look at the wider issue of food waste, we can actually produce food in quantities that suit local needs. This is the dairy at Western Ronston Farm where we've got 11 cows and we turn all the milk from those 11 cows into cheese on the farm. We make mostly traditional Scottish cheeses and we sell it all within Scotland. Uh, we sell probably a quarter of it fairly locally through two farmers markets in Inverness and Elgin. This is cheese that was made yesterday and it'll go back in the press for another 24 hours. So that, that's one day's production. There's four big cheeses and three small ones. Most factory cheese is vacuum packed at quite a young age. It doesn't get the chance to develop the same sort of flavours. The mould contributes to the flavour of the cheese. It's an important part of the ripening. We issued what we call cow shares, which is a, an investment of £500. It's a loan with interest, but the interest is extremely generous by compared with uh, the banks. It's 8%, but it comes in the form of cheese and or animal manure of people's gardens. So it was very helpful for people to have a link with the farm and where their cheese was coming from. And for a lot of people, Cheese is just a commodity that they see in a supermarket. They have no idea where it comes from and certainly no link. You can buy cheese in Asda that says produce of the EU. <laughs> so there's no way of knowing the farmer or the cows that produce that milk. In global terms, it just doesn't make sense for us to be buying cheese from New Zealand and Australia when we've got the best climate in the world for growing grass and, and producing milk. We sowed this grass, it's got herbs in it, this yarrow, dandelion and chicory. There's an economic argument for, for producing it locally because the, the costs of transporting it around the world are, are hidden. Um, you know, you can buy, you could go to Tesco's or somewhere today and buy cheese cheaper than we can sell it wholesale. Um, but there's a lot of hidden costs of <laughs> CO2 emissions and all the rest of it. <laughs> it just makes so much sense for, for food to be produced locally and consumed locally. We've created our own community currency called the Eco. The beauty of the Eco is that it can only be spent, it's only accepted locally here within the community and in the neighbouring Fintoy village. When you compare that to the pound sterling which you spend at the supermarket, for example, as a general rule, every time you spend money at the supermarket, 90% of the money leaves the local economy immediately to go and pay the suppliers on the other side of the world. With the eco, by staying locally, it keeps the purchasing power within the community. We have solar photovoltaic panels on our house. We generate all our electricity. But in order to afford those expensive solar panels, we had to reduce our electricity consumption quite radically. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, that was pretty easy to do and pretty painless. But it's a, it's a process, and it takes time. It takes forethought, and it takes some investment, too. Mm -hmm. I still am an American consumer in many ways. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm always encouraging other people that um, to just start doing what they can, no matter how small it is, and to just continually strive to do more. And I personally, as someone bringing this message to the world, I have to be walking my talk or else people won't listen to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So it's continually a challenge for me. But still! jar of something indistinguishable. In the back of the fridge it's all moldy and horrific. And you know you should recycle it. <laughs> I know I should. But please, can I just throw it away? <laughs> So what 
can we do to prepare for a world without cheap oil? I would say the first thing to do is to look for a community in which you feel at home, which you feel part of. At the heart of both the eco-village and the transition town model is a recognition that within community we are much more powerful and we have much more fun than in trying to solve these problems by ourselves. So having done that, we all have different talents. Some people will naturally be drawn to food production, others perhaps to building community, to creating community currencies, setting up social enterprises, many different ways of building resilience back into our local communities. The first step probably is to look for a transition initiative or an eco-village that is near you. And if there isn't one, create one. The air and the ground and the waters and the fruitfulness of this earth belongs to us all. And for us to recognize that so that we can return to a sustainable way of life, we have to rediscover that indeed the earth is sacred. In other words, we bow to it as the source of everything we are and everything we know. And always with a sense of gratitude for honoring it. So gratitude itself for the earth helps us to survive. It could be an opportunity for us to come together with a different kind of plan for how, how to live together on this planet and to see that plan implemented because the existing plan no longer works. Get to know a neighbor that you've never talked to before. Really strengthen those connections in your community because that's what's going to be important if we go through a tremendous crisis situation. Within that argument that we need to build resilience is the potential for an economic, social and cultural renaissance the likes of which we have never seen before. We are the, the growing consciousness of the planet. And that's, that's our role, that's what humanity's job is to do, is to walk the earth with love. And as we do that, we change everything.
Jingles seduced by cliches. 